Um, I love working there because you know what? I get to see the people that I have assisted, that I have helped out in our community. And I think that's so important. Um, we, we lose a lot sometimes when we, when we don't know the neighbors or the people that we're treating. Uh, when we do know the neighbors, I think it holds you to a higher standard. Because when I go out into the community, I want to hear good things. I don't care to hear <laughs> any any bad stuff. So so I really want to hear some some good things. So I, I hold myself to those standards, and I hold all the bedside nurses to those standards as, as well. Um, making sure that you get the, the best quality treatment that you could possibly get in Coosa Valley. And I will say this: uh, we do a great job. You have less than a 2% chance of getting an infection while you're at Coosa Valley. And you think, boy, that sounds really good. And it is great. But we can still do better. Our goal is zero. Uh, because that 2%, that could be my mom, that could be my wife, that could be my children. Um, so I want to make sure nobody gets infected. And so that's that's what we do. So it's uh it's very it's very important to um, to reduce those numbers. What I'm going to share with you today is going to help you save fifteen thousand seven hundred and thirty four dollars. I'm going to show you how. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about these diseases: influenza, pneumonia, shingles. We're going to talk about the causes, the signs and symptoms, and the way to prevent these uh, infections. We'll start out with influenza. Influenza, or the flu, is a contagious respiratory illness caused by a virus. The virus is not uh, susceptible to antibiotics. It is only susceptible to antivirals. So if you have the flu, getting antibiotics will not help you. It can cause mild to severe illness and at times can lead to death. I think it's important that we, that we think about influenza and a way to prevent it, which the number one way is vaccination. And why I think that is important, three years ago, I have three children. Two of them got vaccinated. One of them did not. Just related to life and me being a sorry parent, I guess, more than anything. <laughs> One of them didn't get that vaccination. My wife, Lisa, and I got the vaccination. Guess who got sick? The one child that didn't have the vaccination. But, and that, that was really unfortunate, uh, but really kind of what, what nailed that home to me was as Lisa and I were taking care of our child, Neither one of us got sick. And that was very important because we didn't need any more sickness in the, in the household. It was bad enough that one got sick, but because of that influenza vaccination, none of the other family members got sick. So uh, kind of important there to, to think about that. So let's talk about some signs and symptoms. With the flu, the symptoms come on suddenly. Um, you can be feeling fine one day, and then the next day, not so much. Uh, people who are sick with the flu often feel one of these symptoms, or maybe multiple of these symptoms. They have a fever or chills, have a cough, sore throat, runny or stuffy nose. Now that cough, runny nose, sore throat can be a variety of different diseases, right? So the thing that we really look at is the fever, the body aches, the headaches sometimes, and the tiredness. Um, nausea and vomiting can be a part of it as well, but this is mostly in children. So the big question people always want to ask is, is it flu or is it cold? And like I said, the thing that really kind of differentiates flu is the high fever, the body aches, and the severity of the illness or the symptoms come on suddenly. When you have a cold, you feel it coming on. You know, you're sick for two or three days or you don't feel good for two or three days, and then all of a sudden you're all stopped up, your chest 
your sore throat, runny nose, all those sorts of things. So that cold comes on, um, comes on gradually. It doesn't come on all of a sudden like the like influenza. <coughs> So that's the, diff that's the difference between cold or flu. So what are some of the things that we can do to prevent flu? Well, one, we try to avoid close contact with sick people. Um, if you know someone's sick, then stay away from them. Or if you want to carry them chicken noodle soup, take it to the door, ring the doorbell, and then, then leave, right? <laughs> Uh, if you are sick, you want to limit contacts as much as pe contacts with other people as much as possible. If you're sick with flu-like symptoms, the tiredness, the body aches, the fever, you want to stay at home for at least 24 hours, and that's 24 hours after your fever is gone. So if I'm sick and I have a fever today, and I, I'm taking my temperature all throughout the day and I don't have a temperature, then tomorrow I can get out. That's 24 hours once you're fever free and not using Tylenol or ibuprofen or any of the things that's going to lower your your fever. Your, your fever. Uh, you want to keep you want to keep away from people. You should cover your nose and mouth with a tissue whenever you cough and sneeze. If you don't have a tissue, then the new recommendation is to use the bend of your arm. Uh, I think. When, when I was in school, we covered our cough with our hands, but that just goes to spread those diseases as I, as I shake somebody's hand. So in the bend of your elbow is where you want to cough and sneeze. Wash your hands often with soap and water. If soap and water is not available, then uh, you can use the alcohol rub. Hand washing. You're going to hear a lot about hand washing. Let me show you how hand washing should go. <clears throat> what I typically see is people do this. Okay, they're rubbing their hands, and that's great. True hand washing, I'm gonna take my hands, I'm gonna rub them together. I'm gonna interlace these fingers, scrub up and down, and then I'm gonna take and scrub the backs of my hands, then the other back of the hand, I take my fingertips, scrub my fingertips, then in the palms of my hands, and my thumbs, and my wrist. How long did that take? That should take you there. <laughs> that should take you as long. <laughs> no way. As long as it takes to sing the ABC song, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, or Jesus Loves Me. <laughs> and here's the thing if you're a great singer then you sing it out loud but if you sing like me you just hum it yeah no need to, no need to do that no ma'am no ma'am uh, 15 to 20 seconds is, is is about what you what you want and what hand washing does the soap interacts with the bacteria and the germs on your hands and it causes them to to kind of lift off from your skin. And then under the water, the germs are flowed down to the stream. So you always want to point your hands down when you're washing your hands and not, not up, because the germs will just rub, run up on your, on your elbows. So you want, to, you want to wash them down. An important thing to remember if you're in a public restroom, uh, you want to leave the water running. And when you get through washing your hands, take that Take that paper towel, you're drying your hands off. Take that dry paper towel, turn the faucet off. Yes. Take a dry paper towel and turn the door knob. Exactly, exactly. So, because that door handle is terribly infected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the whole point of hand washing is really to reduce the amount of organisms found on your hands. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and one thing you'll find. If you, if you look up hand hygiene studies, you'll see that this part of the hand is um, oftentimes contaminated, very hard to get clean, and then your fingernails, um, especially around the cuticle part, very hard to keep clean, uh, very hard to keep clean. That's why in our, um, in our direct patient care areas, we do not allow artificial nails on our nurses because there have been 
uh, several cases, there was a NICU, a neonatal intensive care unit, that had four babies that actually died, and it's traced back to the nurse's fingernails. <laughs> so, so we don't <laughs> we don't we don't necessarily allow uh, fingernails in the uh, direct patient care areas. So wash your hands with soap and water. Avoid touching your eyes, your nose, and your mouth. And boy, this 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 is my personal uh, hardship. I, I just I just all the time touching my mouth and touching my hand and thinking about things, and uh, boy, it's very hard for me to do, but uh, don't do that. Clean and disinfect surfaces and objects that may be contaminated with germs like the flu. These are, these are things in your house, like your doorknob, this is the telephone, this is the remote control. You think about all those things that are high touch areas, things that are being touched a lot, the refrigerator handle, uh, I know when my kids get sick, that's one of the things that we start doing is disinfecting all the door handles, um, wiping down all of those those different knobs within the within the house. So, um, make sure that you're disinfecting those those areas. All right, so get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Now is the time to get vaccinated. October to March is flu season. Now, you can get flu any time of the year. Uh, don't think that just because we say it's flu season, don't think that the little influenza virus is going, oh, I can't wait till October 1st so I can go and take up somebody. No, you can still get flu any time of the year. It's more common during October and March because uh, we're more, we're closer together because the cold weather and because the air is, uh, the air is cooler, it allows that droplet virus to, to, to go farther distance, farther distances than what it is. So get vaccinated. Um, flu vaccines usually uh, help protect against three or four different viruses, and it depends on what the virus was from the previous year. So they bring it over and they make, the scientists make a best guess on what virus is going to be out there. So that's what this year's uh, virus will be. It reduces flu illness, doctor's visits, and missed work. Flu vaccines also has been shown to reduce a child's risk of dying from influenza. We had a pretty significant flu season last year with several um, pediatric deaths and several young adult deaths as well uh, related to the flu. Um, so it's, it's very important to get vaccinated because that reduces the likelihood that you will die from the flu. Even if you do get sick um, after you've had the flu vaccination, the severity of the illness is going to, is going to be, be reduced. Everyone six months of age and older should get the flu vaccine. Um, so that's everyone in this room. A child that's less than six months, if the mother gets vaccinated during pregnancy, there is some uh, evidence that the immunity will pass from mother to infant. And so uh, it's recommended that pregnant females get vaccinated as well. If you are at high risk for flu complications, um, that includes the people with chronic health conditions like asthma, diabetes, heart and lung disease, and all people over the age of 65 should get vaccinated. Um, vaccination is important to healthcare workers. We are pushing right now for 90% vaccination rate at Coosa Valley because not only does it reduce the likelihood that you're going to get the influenza, it also reduces the likelihood that you're going to transmit it. And that's, to me, that's the more important part of that puzzle that we don't transmit it to anyone. Okay? Let's talk about pneumonia. Pneumonia is a, is a pretty serious illness. Um, it is an infection of the lungs. It causes mild to severe illness. Uh, oftentimes we can treat it with antibiotics, depending on the cause. 
Vaccines do prevent some types of pneumonia. And it's still a leading cause of death in children under the age of five years old. Common signs of, signs of pneumonia include cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. And what happens, the, the bacteria, you can see here's healthy lung. You got the left lung, the right lung, that's, that's fairly healthy. And then you got the disease portion right here. And so what happens on a cellular level is, is the alveoli, which are the tiny air sacs, causes some leakage to come, and it prevents the air exchange from happening. That's why you're sick. Um, several patients that I've had over the years with pneumonia, they get well fairly quickly, but they are not up to 100% for six to eight months even after they're sick. They just don't have the lung capacity, and even though the bacteria is dead, the cells in the lung has to regenerate and has to improve uh, as it gets as the as time goes by. So it's very important um, that that this disease is prevented. You can help prevent pneumonia and other respiratory infections by washing your hands. You'll hear that a lot. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Disinfecting the the highly touched surfaces. Making healthy choices. If you smoke. Uh, it is a good idea to quit smoking. There are very good programs now. Um, there are some medications that help you quit smoking. But very important to, to quit smoking if you smoke. And then if you have chronic disease, make sure that you manage those, um, those diseases. There are two types of pneumonia vaccine. There's the, there's the Prevnar 13 and the Pneumovax 23. Now, the 13 protects against 13 types of viruses and bacteria. The 23 protects against 23. Uh, the 13 came out first, and then the 23 came along afterwards. So uh, there are several recommendations on the schedule for pneumonia vaccines, and we'll get into those. But any child younger than two years of age and all adults 65 years of age are encouraged to get the pneumonia vaccine. And then there's also special situations between 19 and 64, and we'll look at a few of those. So 19 through 64, if you have a cerebral spinal fluid leak or if you have cochlear implants, uh, there, there is a recommendation. Adults 19 through 64 years of age, if you have these diseases, it's it's recommended that you give a dose of the 13 and then two doses of the 23. Um, and then, you know, some, some things that I'm thinking about um, in particular, um, you've got multiple myeloma, leukemia, um, sickle cell disease, any of those may be um, an indication for vaccine. And then 19 through 64, this, if you have these diseases, alcoholism, chronic heart disease, chronic liver disease, chronic lung disease, or diabetes. So, chronic heart disease, heart failure, chronic lung disease, COPD, asthma, diabetes, you get a dose of the, of the 23. That's if you're 19 through 64. Adults over 65 years um, get a dose of the 13, if you've never previously received a dose, the 23, one year after the 13 dose, and then five years after the previous 23 dose. And then adults who receive one or two doses of the 23 before age 65 should receive one final dose of the vaccine at age 65 or older. Now, that is, there's a lot of if this, then that, and, and one thing that I, I found while preparing for this was an app. And it's the greatest thing, it's the neatest thing. I've been asking all my friends about it. And I put in the date of birth, then we check off any kind of chronic conditions that you have. If you've received the pneumococcal vaccine before, and then it gives you your recommendations. So I'll be glad to, to, talk, to talk with you um, afterwards, and we can put that in. If you're concerned, 
you need. Do I need this? Do I not need this? Do I need a booster? Do I not need a booster? All of that uh, takes into consideration those sorts of things. Our last topic is going to be shingles. Um, shingles is a very painful neurological virus that attacks typically one of your um, nerve endings. Um, had a patient that had extreme pain to the point where she could not have anything touch her skin. And she, she ended up having to wear, it was, it was on her abdomen, and she ended up having to take t-shirts and cut them the sides out of them so the t-shirt would rub against the, the rash that she has. Extremely painful. Um, so this is, a, this is a vaccination and a way to protect yourself um, that's going to save you from a lot of pain. Um, the shingles is a varicella zoster virus, a painful rash, and the rash blisters and scabs over usually in seven to ten days, and it fully clears up in two to four weeks. The, the virus is spread through direct contact with fluid from the rash blisters. So if you have this rash, um, or if a loved one, family member has this rash, and you come in contact with some of the liquid on the blisters, that can be transmitted to the tubes. A person with active shingles um, only spreads the rash through the blister phase. One out of three people in the United States will develop shingles. So, in this room, you look to your right, you look to your left, somebody is probably going to have the, the shingles once in their, in their lifetime. If you have had chicken pox, you are at risk for shingles. And probably everyone in this room has had chicken pox. Um, most adults born before 1984 have had the chicken pox. Even if you don't remember, there's no documentation that, that you had the chicken pox. You've probably had the chicken pox. To, pre to prevent the spreading of the virus, cover the rash. When the, when the rash, like I said, when it's in the blister phase, you want to be sure to cover it. Cover it with a gauze, um, any any type of thing like that, just to just to uphold those secretions. You want to make sure of that. Avoid touching or scratching the rash. And look what look what's next. Wash your hands. Wash your hands. <laughs> Avoid contact with people if you have with the following people. If you have a rash, pregnant women who've never had chickenpox or the chickenpox vaccine. Premature or low birth weight infants, people with weakened immune systems, such as people re receiving immunosuppressive drugs or undergoing chemo chemotherapy, organ transplant recipients, and people with HIV infection. You want to avoid those people. There's a couple of pictures of shingles, and you can see that that's very, uh, this, this one here, this is a person's abdomen. And typically, the shingles goes in a single line. Uh, this is a face, and you can see that it's affecting this eyeball here. Um, very painful when it gets down into the eye. People can actually lose their eyes, lose their eyesight if the, if the virus gets on, on the optic nerve. I did, on my research, I tried to identify if the if the uh, lines meet, does the person die? I know that's a, that's an old wives' tale that I've heard a lot. I could not find that anywhere in the, in the literature if that's true or not. But I, I'm thinking just from the severity of it, if the lines meet, then it's pretty bad infection. So it, there may be some maybe some truth to that. Uh, before the before the rash. Begins. People often have pain, itching, or tingling in the areas where this rash will develop, and this can happen several days um, in front of the in front of the rash. The most common complication of shingles is this long-term nerve pain called post-herpetic neurology (PHN). And what happens once the rash is gone, the pain 
is still there, and it's still, um, it's still, it's still there. The lady that I was talking about that had such pain, um, she lived a lifetime of that, um, of that pain. So another reason to get vaccinated. Other symptoms: fever, headache, chills, and an upset stomach. The shingles vaccine. So there used to be there used to be Zostravax. Okay, uh, Zostravax was a, was a good vaccine, but now there's a new one called Shingrix. Anyone over the age of fifty should get the Shingrix vaccination. It's two doses. And it's 90% effective at preventing shingles. So it's very, very effective. Um, you should get the, the shingles even if you've already had the shingles. And then the risk of shingles and complications increases as you, as you get older. So if you've not had the vaccine, you still need to, you still, there's still time to get it because your risk increases each year as you, as you get older. Um, like I said, it does require two doses. The second dose is usually two to six months after the first dose. And you, you have to get that second dose. So you get the first dose and let's say that you have, uh, you have problems. You're, it's sore at the injection site. Um, you know, it's, it's, it causes you not to not to feel real well. You still need that second dose, even though you've had difficulty with the first dose. Unless you had an absolute allergic reaction, anaphylaxis, you want to get that second second dose of Shingrix. All right. So I've told you a lot today. And so my question is, so what? That fifteen thousand seven hundred and thirty-four dollars that I told you about—that's the average cost of a hospital stay in the United States. So if you're vaccinated against influenza, if you're vaccinated against pneumonia, if you're vaccinated against shingles, you can save yourself that fifteen thousand dollars plus. You don't have to go into the hospital. You don't have to run the risk of, of coming into contact with other things. Uh, that's that $15,000 savings that I was talking about. So, so what? Here's what I want you to take away. <laughs> Wash your hands. <laughs> cover, cover your cough and sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> Stay home if you're sick. When we were talking about influenza, you know, it's a good idea to have supplies in your home. Water, medication, soups, tissue, all those things that when you get sick, you don't have to run out to the store and get things. Um, if you have a family, 